Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this new edition of the ATL Cell uh, Seminar at CSL Paris. Uh, today, I mean, we have the great pleasure to have Diego Garlaschelli as a speaker. I just say a few words about Diego, who is actually now associate professor at the IMT School of Advanced Studies in Lucca, Italy, uh, Tuscany. And, uh, and, and he's also been I mean, coordinating in this IMT school, the network unit. At the same time, he's also associate professor at the University of Leiden and the Lawrence Institute for Theoretical Physics, where he also leads the econophysics and network theory team. So as you can understand, Diego, I mean, uh, has a degree in physics, is also a PhD in physics. Uh, so the degree from Sapienza University in Rome and then the PhD, if I don't go wrong, from the University of Siena, so August Toscany. And uh, he has a wide range of interests, uh, uh, basically interdisciplinary applications of uh, statistical physics and complexity. And of course, network theory is one of the, the his favorite subjects, along with uh, financial complexity and in general social dynamics, using I mean a wide range of tools coming from statistical physics, information theory, and of course network theory. And I guess I mean today's seminar will be about network theory and I guess a specific application, which is the reconstruction of networks from only local information, which is a well standing problem. So thanks a lot, Diego, for being with us and the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Vittorio, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, very nice seminar series that you have uh, at Sony and um, and also for this nice introduction. So yes, indeed, my uh, contribution today is about uh, network reconstruction. And as you said, uh, we are very interested in network modeling, so in network theory. And, um, and this is a particular application. We are also very interested in trying to translate uh, theoretical models of networks, especially networks with constraints, into a useful uh, uh, and possibly helpful applications um, uh, for society. So, Actually, the, the motivation for this particular uh, method that I'm going to talk about is the idea of the consequences of shocking a, a network. And specifically, we may already now uh, focus on the example of uh, financial networks and interbank networks, where shocks typically means that some nodes uh, enter some phase of financial distress. In an extreme situation, this means that one bank uh, is default or one firm in, a, in an economic network of supply chains, for instance, uh, is bankrupt. So there is one economic unit of the system that is shocked by uh, some perturbation. We want to distinguish uh, between endogenous and exogenous perturbations for the, for the starting one. But then what happens is the propagation of this shock throughout the system. So clearly, depending on the structure of the network, one can expect very different outcomes. So if you imagine the full spectrum of possible graphs from the empty graph on the left to the full complete graph on the right, clearly when you shock a, a node in an empty network, there is no network effect clearly, so there is no propagation, so any uh, perturbation will die out immediately. When you do that in a full network, you are at, in the opposite extreme where instantly every other node feels the perturbation, the initial perturbation, but at the same time, the entity of the perturbation is diluted, in a sense, among all the possible, all, all the neighbors of the node. So, in terms of uh, uh, breadth of the perturbation, this is quite broad because it's investing potentially the entire network, but in terms of intensity of the perturbation, this is severely reduced by the fact that uh, the, the shock gets diluted. So there is a lot of buffer, in a sense, for the network to um, uh, live with that perturbation. Now, in between, of course, there is the interesting and realistic situation. So depending on the, the structure of the particular network we are talking about, there can be very complicated cascading effects. So uh, the actual phenomenology 
uh, will depend a lot on what is the initial node being shocked, for instance, and then what, what are the properties of the network in the end, the, the path lengths and uh, how, how connected the network is and, and so on. So this is why in the literature, especially after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, there has been a flourishing of definitions of uh, metrics of risk that try to overcome the traditional metrics uh, in, uh, in the financial and banking literature, where normally you look at the health of a financial institution by only focusing at quantities that are in the balance sheet. So basically you look at node-specific information that disregards the network, so the position in the network, so typically a bank uh, has two quantities that are relevant. One is the total assets, so the total amount of money that it's being that that the bank owns somehow, which includes the money that has been borrowed or that has been lent to other banks and that can be claimed back later. So this is among the assets of a bank. And then the other number is the total liabilities of a bank, which uh, is the opposite a quantity, which is what the uh, bank has to give back. So basically, what, typically you just look at these two numbers and if the, the, you own more than you owe to others, then your equity, which is the difference between the total assets and total liabilities, will be positive. And, uh, but of course, what can happen in reality is that two banks that have precisely the same equity may have, um, may be in completely different positions in the network. So the systemicness, so the contribution to the systemic risk, which is the risk of collapse of the system as a whole, can be very different for two banks that have the same local measure of risk. So depth rank is one example of this um, metrics that have been introduced that try to overcome this limitation of node-specific uh, definitions of risk. And they, in principle, this family of metrics takes the, take the entire network as an input and produce a number for every node in terms of the contribution to the systemic risk. So, of course, we know also uh, because of uh, now we, we care a lot about uh, epidemics clearly these days, we know that network structure decides the fate of dynamics uh, quite strongly. So when uh, I mean, in the, in the Middle Ages, when the, the Black Death was spreading, this was really mainly due to uh, physical movement of people either uh, on foot or by horse. So there this is a process that is strictly uh, constrained by geometry and geometric distances so that you could even see this uh, wave fronts propagating at a typical speed. Whereas nowadays we know very well that uh, the, the, the main uh, means of transport of propagation of epidemics uh, are possibly very long range connections like the airline connections. So this gives rise to a very bursty and erratic behavior of the propagation of, of the epidemic. So clearly the, the, the things that is different in the two scenarios is ultimately the structure of the network of contacts. So the same goes for financial crisis, which I'm talking about today and international trade and whatever. So if we accept on one hand that the network structure is crucial in order to make a reasonable assessment of risk in financial systems, on the other hand, we have to accept the fact that the uh, information about the connections is highly confidential. So, for instance, in a network of banks uh, that are connected by loans, so now the nodes are banks in a given country, for instance, and then the connections are directed links representing how much a bank has borrowed from another bank, so how much the bank has to give back. Uh, so this is uh, a directed and weighted network, uh, but this is totally unknown. I mean, because in many cases, banks can agree on such contracts and such loans bilaterally uh, in an over-the-counter fashion. So no other uh, bank will know of the existing uh, uh, connections between any two banks in the system. And especially also for regulators, so uh, central banks would like to monitor, of course, the financial stability of the system. At the best, they can do this on their own domestic banks. But for instance, the, the, the Bank of England doesn't know what's going on between German banks. Uh, and so uh, since, of course, a lot of 
uh, English banks are exposed to German banks, uh, it would be very helpful also for regulators to uh, guess what the connections are. And uh, so this uh, basically gives rise to uh, a challenge. Uh, the challenge is the, the, the problem of network reconstruction. So we may picture the, in a simplified way the problem uh, as follows. So imagine there is some network which is there, uh, but it's unknown. And we call this network G star. So G stands for graph. A star is the particular graph that we that, that is there, the true graph, but that is unobservable, however. Now, because of confidentiality, we do not get information about the topology. We only get information about local properties. For instance, in this cartoon here, um, we, we imagine that for every bank, we know the total number of links. So you see, basically, we know the degree of every node in this network. And now the, the question is, so this degree can be formally written as a vector C of constraints. Why constraints? Because we would like to reconstruct the network back, starting from the constraints. These are constraints because we know that these numbers are real. And we need to come up with uh, compatible network configurations given these constraints. So they, really, they are really constraining the inference uh, procedure. Now you see this vector is a, is a function in general of G star. In this particular example here, the vector is the vector of degrees. So for every node i, I know the degree ki of that uh, node. And I would like to make optimal use of this information. So clearly the problem is underdetermined. So I will never come up with exactly the original network. There is not enough uh, information. But then the challenge becomes, uh, okay, we need a probabilistic solution. So it will be a probabilistic solution in the end because multiple configurations are compatible. So the challenge is finding a good probability distribution uh, over the space of possible graphs. And good means that we should, um, that whatever we then uh, simulate on the reconstructed ensemble of graphs endowed with this probability that we are looking for, so whatever we average over this probability about the graph properties should be realistic, especially the processes that we think are um, um, connected to, the, uh, to systemic risk. So for instance, if we now want to run a stress test on the system, we cannot run it on the true network. We have to run it on the reconstructed ensemble. So we will need to take averages over the probability uh, of each graph in such ensemble. And we would like the average stress test, in a sense, to be a fair representative of the outcome of the stress test that, that I could have done on the real network if I had had the um, empirical information about it. So then, uh, clearly, this is a probabilistic methodology that we're looking for. In a, in a sense, this is going to protect privacy. So this is good because in the end, there is a reason why these connections are confidential. So we cannot break the rule of confidentiality, of course. So there will be probabilities that, in a sense, keep uh, confidentiality uh, in the system. Um, and at the same time, we would like higher order effects to be fairly predicted. So we know local information. We want a good guess of higher order information. So actually, there has been a, a long history uh, starting from a very simple, naive solution to the problem. Uh, and this was used by central banks. Uh, and it's clearly a naive model, which also is responsible for the severe underestimation of the um, uh, entity of the financial crisis, so of the consequences of the financial crisis in the, in the interbank sector, at least in 2008. So the, the solution, the naive solution goes as follows. So let us call W, I to J, the true link weight of the graph G star. So this, this is the true link weight in the system. Uh, and it's telling us how much bank I is exposed to bank J. Um, okay, we don't know this number. What we know is these two numbers, S in I and S out I, that you find on the right, on the top right. This is, this is the in strength of node I and the out strength of node I, which means 
the sum of all the incoming link weights into node i and the sum of all the outgoing link weights. So these are the two numbers that, at least for the interbank sector, represent the total assets of node i and the total liabilities. So this is the total money being lent by node i and be borrowed from node i. So these are the two numbers that typically you, you look at in balance sheets. Um, now, the challenge is, okay, we would like to know WIJ. We only know the summations over J of WIJ. So we need a guess for WIJ. We need this W tilde. So W tilde is the guess or inferred or reconstructed value of the WIJ. We would like to infer this from this list of numbers. So you see, in this case, the vector C is a 2n dimensional vector because for every node I know these two pieces of information. Now one compatible solution is the one that you find at the bottom below this, uh, this graph where uh, so the graph is completely connected in this case the reconstructed graph is completely connected and now for every pair of nodes you guess a value wij which is the product of the out strength of node i times the in strength of node j divided by w. Big w is nothing but the total weight in the network of all links in the network, which is then necessarily the sum of s out over all nodes i, which is also the sum of s in over all nodes i. So if you know s in and s out for every node, you also know this big w. You simply take the summations of all strengths in or all strengths out. So you know these three numbers, uh, and uh, from these three numbers you compute W tilde ij, and you know this for all pairs of nodes. Now, now why is this viable in terms of the uh, constraints that you know? Well, because now if you sum this W tilde over i, you see that S out produces big W, which cancels with the denominator, and, I, and then you are left with S in of j. So the reconstructed in strength of the network, uh, which is obtained by summing W tilde over J, is the same as the original, the true in strength. And the same goes if you sum over I. You get the reconstructed out strength is the same as the true out strength. So it is a uh, compatible solution. So the margins are replicated, but clearly the topology cannot be correct because it is a complete graph. So if you compare this with a few networks for which it has been possible to uh, access the data and uh, do some network analysis, you will uh, uh, see that real interbank networks are sparse. Sparse means that the number of links grows linearly in the number of nodes, whereas on the left, the, full, the, the complete graph has a number of links that go, grows like the square of the number of nodes. So clearly there are too many links in the reconstructed network, in the naive reconstructed network, which are then necessarily too weak because the margins are the same in the real world and in the reconstructed world. So on average, each link in the reconstructed network is uh, a factor one over n smaller than, well, than a factor n smaller than uh, the true link weight because the number of uh, net the number of edges is of order n square in the reconstructed network and is only order n in the real network so this means that now these links that you reconstruct with these weights in this formula uh, at the bottom are very uh, weak in terms of weight so if you now simulate a shock on the system it is very difficult for these tiny link weights to actually put the neighbors of the node that has been shocked into a stress situation where, for instance, now the new equity of the neighbors becomes negative. So this is a threshold process that has to be, there's a threshold to be overcome in a sense. And if the link weights are too small, you will never reach that threshold. So it seems on the reconstructed network that the system is very stable, whereas in reality, this may be not. So that's why we need uh, uh, a sparse solution to the to the system, and there are a lot of greedy algorithms that try uh, that can come up with some sparse solution. We are uh, mostly interested in uh, a, a general approach to the problem, 
where rather than a single greedy solution that is not guaranteed to be the, the, the real network, clearly, produces, as I said, an ensemble of networks. So this is something that can be done by exploiting the maximum entropy principle, because the maximum entropy uh, is the uh, in principle you need if you want to make unbiased uh, inference. So if you want to, uh, well, not to add additional hidden assumptions in your uh, uh, reconstruction method, uh, and then to have, in principle, the most unbiased uh, solution. So then, uh, it, formally, it goes like, okay, we have some constraints that we take from the empirical partial information about the system, we maximize Shannon entropy, and we find some uh, probability distribution over the space of compatible networks. So if uh, now we have to choose uh, the, the, the constraint, in principle, the constraint is precisely this list of strengths of all the nodes. Now, if you use the list of strengths, in this example here, uh, this, the situation is simplified to an undirected graph, undirected weighted graph, but the same goes with a slight modification for a directed uh, network. So if we impose the strengths of every node as the um, constraints, then we come up with uh, a probability distribution over weighted graphs for which we will have some expected link weight, which will be then our um, expected weight in the reconstruction of, in the reconstructed ensemble. So this formula here would replace the previous formula with the big W at the denominator. But now if we do this in practice, you see in the plot uh, there are many colors. Now every color is a different network. Every point is one node in that network. So there are uh, 12 networks being compared here, and there are all nodes for all these networks together in the same plot. And now the plot is comparing on the x-axis uh, a higher order quantity that we have not enforced. This is in particular the average degree of the neighbors of each node. And then on the y-axis, there is the same quantity in the reconstructed ensemble, so the average, the ensemble average of the same property for every node. So you see that the plot is horrible because there are all these horizontal lines that mean that in um, each network, all the nodes get the same value for the reconstructed average nearest neighbor degree. Whereas in the real network, different nodes have different values for this quantity. So Ideally, we would like to see all these points aligned on the identity line. So this is showing us that naively using the maximum entropy principle by simply taking what we know from the data and maximizing the uh, entropy doesn't work in this case. And the deep reason is that in reading the list of strengths, we have no information about the density of the network. So uh, all the configurations that have the same strength sequence, but possibly very different link densities, are generated with the same probability in the ensemble. So then the resulting ensemble will be an average over sparse and dense configurations. Since there are way more dense configurations than sparse, especially with large values of the strengths, um, because here strengths can accumulate on, you have many different configurations that can be all topologically complete, but with different values of the weights, and you are considering all these, pro these configurations as equally probable, and they are way more than the number of sparse configurations. So overall, you create a network that is too dense. Actually, this network is quite is always close to complete graph, and that's why you have this constant, basically, uh, trends, where for every node, the neighborhood looks precisely the same because for every every node sees an almost complete graph. Now, in, by contrast, things get much better if you pretend for a second that you know the degrees of the nodes, which now this is a topological information. So now you you assume to know the number of connections of every node, and now you do the same exercise. So you maximize the entropy. Now you get a different probability distribution, and in place of an expected link weight, you have the connection probability, so the probability that two nodes are connected. 
uh, it's a different functional form. All the numbers are different here. So what you see here, the y's and the x values are nothing but the Lagrange multipliers that you need in the top in order to control for the strengths and at the bottom in order to control for the degrees. But whatever they are, you get this probability of connections. And now you see that the result becomes much nicer. So now you see all these networks aligned. Well, they, they, are, they are scattered, of course, but they are uh, much better aligned along the identity. In particular, there is variation now inside each network, uh, which is uh, very close to the empirical variation of these quantities uh, over nodes for that network. So the, the recipe works great. The problem is that we do not know these degrees empirically. So how can we, uh, well, is there a trick that we can use? It turns out, yes, there is one. Uh, so from the functional form of this probability, uh, as I said, X i is a Lagrange multiplier coupled to the degree K i. We do not know the degree. If we knew the degree, we would come up with the value of x i that controls for it. Now it turns out that when you do this exercise on a network that you know completely, the Lagrange multipliers are very often linearly related to the strengths. So the Lagrange multiplier controlling for the out degree of a node turns out to be linearly related to the strength, to the out strength of the same node. And the same for the in degree. And you see this now in these plots where on the y-axis there are different degrees. So every point is a node in one network. And then on the y-axis you have the in degrees or the out degrees. And on the x-axis you have the in strength or the out strength for the same nodes. So you see the blue curve is this uh, theoretical curve that you obtain by replacing the Lagrange multipliers xi and xj with this product strength out, strength in for every node. So up to an overall global proportionality constant z, which is this proportionality constant between the Lagrange multiplier for the degree and the corresponding strength of the node. So apart from a global uh, density parameter, uh, you have this relation in blue um, and the, 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 which is interpolating between the empirical points, the red points. Okay, so the fact that there exists this relationship between the Lagrange multipliers of the degree that I do not observe and the strengths that I observe allows us basically to guess the degrees from the strengths. And now after guessing the degrees from the strengths, we can use these guessed degrees as constraints into the uh, maximum entropy uh, methodology. Okay, so you see that this um, uh, technique uh, can replicate properties like uh, how the different uh, degrees of the neighbors of a node scale with the degree of the node itself, how the clustering uh, scales with the degree, and so on. So a number of um, Topological properties that are typically considered in order to characterize what kind of network we are talking about uh, are replicated uh, quite well. So then say the, the, the summary for these methodologies, well, in a sense, moving from a deterministic solution where you have one complete graph with these deterministic weights on it to a sparse solution where now you have probabilities. So the weight that you want to reconstruct will be zero with some probability one minus pij, where pij is this um, connection probability that you see at the bottom. And uh, if the link is there, then there will be a weight such that the unconditional average of the weight is the same as the one that you have on the left. So it's still preserving that you also match the in and out strength of the empirical network as margins of your reconstructed network. Um, but at the same time, so you see that this, uh, so equating this uh, unconditional weight in the reconstructed method with the weight in the naive method uh, shows that now all the weights that are created are shifted by this parameter z to the minus one. 
which is the same density parameter you see in the probability, uh, in the connection probability. So, so this shows that every link is now heavier in the reconstructed network because it, it is shifted upwards by this constant z to the minus one, which is um, higher the sparser the network is. So a bigger z means higher connection probability, so a denser network. And you see that then uh, the, the, the shift compared to the traditional method becomes smaller. So when z is infinity, there is no difference between the traditional method and the new method. When z is smaller and smaller, you see more and more difference, both in terms of sparsity and in terms of link intensity. OK, so this has been uh, um, uh, tried on uh, a few in a few settings, also uh, Europe wide in a network of exposures uh, between institutions. And uh, what is quite interesting is that um, if you now do analysis like a percolation analysis, so you start uh, removing with probability P uh, or retaining with probability P uh, the links in the actual network and in the reconstructed ensemble, you see that the curves uh, really overlap. Uh, so you see, uh, Red is the real network and blue is the synthetic network here. You see also in terms of path length distributions, they are quite similar. And, um, and also the depth rank analysis. So now this is really the result of simulations where you shock certain nodes at the beginning and then you see how the, the shocks are propagated through the network using the depth rank model. And you see that in this case as well, uh, the, the, the thing is very well replicated. I have to say we, we were very lucky because uh, we did this analysis uh, in the, at the moment where um, several groups independently were testing different reconstruction methods. And um, so somehow we managed to be uh, on time um, delivering this methodology, publishing this methodology. So um, for, for the moment, four different studies have tested this uh, methodology and we were very happy to see that uh, independently they reached uh, very positive conclusions about this methodology. Uh, so I see that I have, I'm already uh, out of time, so I stop here and uh, the rest is left for questions. Thanks a lot, Diego. Very, very interesting and also very, I would say, pedagogical. I mean, your your exposure. So thanks a lot for this. I guess there will be many many questions coming, and perhaps I can just start. I mean, while people warm up on this. So if I if I if I don't go wrong, so basically your method is exploiting two n uh, variables. So the information about two n variables on the network out of something like alpha n square information needed for the network. Then alpha I mean, is actually measuring the sparseness of the network, right? Okay. Right. So the question is, since you are so effective in reconstructing the network, still, I mean, exploiting a very tiny fraction of the information, so one over n, basically, or I mean, according to, okay. So where the missing information is going? Perhaps it's a naive question, but uh, either, I mean, this information is not important i mean for the reconstruction i mean it's like uh, i guess in a in a in a compression algorithm like jpeg so you lose information which is not really relevant for the perception in this case okay. right so, what's going so, on here? no no this is a, a brilliant question and actually you can really regard this as a um, compression algorithm in a sense so uh, in terms of degrees of freedom so let, 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 let us putting the weight on the links once you get the links right is not a problem. So uh, it's really this formula there. So uh, WIJ is either zero or that number. So putting the weights is not the big deal. The big deal is guessing where the ones are. Mm -hmm. So let us think for a moment of a binary problem. So you have a binary graph which then, uh, so what is the bits that you need? How many bits you need to encode the binary graph, right? So this would amount to calculating the, uh, the entropy, the Shannon's entropy of a graph ensemble without constraints, so without knowing anything before. Mm -hmm. 
So then the entropy, well, the number of configurations is two to the n choose two. So mm -hmm. two to the number of pairs of nodes, because these are all binary. So these are all bits, zeros and ones, uh, among n choose two possible nodes. Mm -hmm. now, uh, so the entropy is scales like n squared, uh, because it's the log of this number. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, when we specify, when we pretend we know the degrees, we are basically uh, constraining the network in such a way that the typical realizations will be only a subset of all the possible realizations. So if you calculate the entropy of the ensemble of graphs with the given degrees in the sparse limit, so precisely when you have just uh, order n links and not order n square, you see that the entropy is uh, of order n. So there is indeed the compression from an entropy of order n square to an entropy of order n when you impose the, the constraints. Uh, now, since real networks are characterized by these very heterogeneous degree distributions, uh, uh, right? So already in the real networks, there is this reduction of information. So you don't need to deal with all these possible graphs uh, in order to describe mm -hmm. the real world networks. You can stick to that subset, right? So the subset of graphs with this degree sequence that is very heterogeneous are precisely have an entropy order n. So I think the method is effective because it gets rid of many uninteresting configurations. Then, of course, there is still the, the, the question, OK, now you still have order n entropy. Uh, how come you guess many properties right, even if you still have a huge number of net possible networks, clearly? Yes, yes. But I guess then the, the, the real ones are much less than the potential ones in the ensemble. So you care about those ones. Right. Yes. OK, is there uh, any any question from the audience? She can either write on the chat or just step in and ask Diego directly. OK, while we wait. OK, David, please. I, I was wondering for the preservation of uh, confidentiality, you would like the WIJ tilde to be quite different in average to the true value of uh, of um, WIJ? And did, did you check that there is no correlation between the average WIJ tilde and uh, the WIJ? You mean between the true WIJ and the reconstructed one? Yeah. No, very often there is very good correlation. Um, but but so you, break, that, you break confidentiality of uh, WLG even. The point is, if the link is produced, but this is a random event, then you guess the link weight quite well. But still there is a probability for this to happen. So in principle, uh, if there is no, if you don't know anything, you have a, a one half probability that two nodes are connected. So the confidentiality is not on typically um, meant to preserve, to um, protect the information of the amount of money involved in, in the in the contract. It's to prevent the knowledge of the existence of the contract itself. So. Uh, Normally, you have a one half, one half chance that two nodes are connected if you assume nothing about the uh, link density. If you guess the uh, overall density right, then the chance that any two nodes are connected is precisely equal to the average density in the network. Here, we are refining this by having these heterogeneous PIJs that are different from different pairs of nodes. So the possible breakdown of confidentiality is, has more to be looked for in the um, values of the PIJ rather than in the, uh, so on how the individual PIJs deviate from the average P, so the average uh, connection probability in the system, which is the link density, rather than in how much the reconstructed weights deviate from the empirical one. Because you see, we get them right 
when we create the link randomly. Otherwise, we put a zero, so then we miss them entirely. So what is playing the, the big role here is the probability rather than the link rate. OK, but like if you take many uh, a big ensemble, a big, many samples of networks by this method, and you mm -hmm. average the result, would it uh, uh, match the true network or? Uh, we get something very close to the graph on the left. I think we get precisely the graph on the left. So the graph on the left can be seen as the ensemble average okay. of the ensemble on the right. So then you will disclose some connections that are true. So there will be some false, some true positives, but there will be the majority of false positives. So I mean, disclosing something for everyone is like not disclosing it for, for, for no one, right? In the sense that uh, people will know well, we'll give no importance to the existence of links in this ensemble average because by construction, whatever method you use that is probabilistic will produce positive expected weights because weights are, are, are positive. So the ensemble average is necessarily positive. You cannot have zero uh, average weight unless it's a deterministic zero. So um, any method will produce in the end a complete graph as an ensemble average. So in a sense, everyone is breaking confidentiality in the same manner. Um, it's not a true breakdown of confidentiality. But in any case, I agree. I mean, especially if you have very uh, big hubs in the network with very large strength, if S out and S in are very big, the probability approach is one it means that you're almost sure these two guys are connected. So in a sense, you can break confidentiality locally. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that this can be then, uh, I mean, you, you can publish the reconstructed network and send it around, including the um, identity of the nodes. No, this is still not possible, clearly. Uh, but if you need to do a stress test where now the identity of the nodes is not, in, not that important, unless you are a regulator. If you're a regulator, you do not disclose this information. You can run the stress test in, I mean, in your server and not disclose the outcome to anyone, but I mean, have your own uh, monitoring uh, improved. Uh, so I'm not saying that one can attach identities to the, the labels and then can safely publish the outcome of the reconstruction because very often the reconstruction is quite close to the real one. So this still can't be done. But statistically, you can use this uh, even when you don't know the complete data. OK, thank you very much. So Diego, there is another question from Vito who is asking about the correlation between K, so the, the, the degree and the strength. Because it seems that, uh, I mean, approximating the strength with the, with the degree, except this uh, factor Z, seems quite good. Um, well, appro approximating, um, so the, the degree is a quite complicated function of the strength. So. You see the, the theoretical curve is a nice smooth line, mm -hmm. but this line is the summation over J of this function Pij at the top. The yes. so the, I guess the question was more empirical. If you just plot uh, for each node the degree versus the strength, do you get a power law or anything similar? No, no, it, it, it's precisely these red points. So this okay. is degree versus strength in these plots. All ah, these okay, okay, okay. four plots are degrees versus strength. Now, there has been an early claim when the earliest uh, paper on weighted network was published that degrees and strengths are indeed power law distributed, uh, power law related okay. uh, in the weighted networks. This can't be true throughout the entire range of values simply because you can imagine to increase the strength of a node indefinitely, but you can't increase the degree indefinitely. So, on a finite network, the, the degree is bounded by n minus one, whereas you can have strength which is as big as you want. It will also depend on the units of measure you, 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 you use for the weight. So you see the saturation in this curve is precisely due to this. You can have the nodes with a very big strength. So the strength can grow along the x-axis indefinitely, but the degree cannot exceed 
uh, n minus 1. And this is captured by the fact that this probability is truly a probability in the sense that it's between 0 and 1, and it's the result of the maximum entropy construction that um, assigns this functional dependence between the degree and uh, the Lagrange multiplier for the degree. Okay, thank you. Any further questions from the audience? Vita is thanking. You're welcome. While we wait for another question, actually, I have another one, which is okay. Now, I guess, I mean, this technique seems to work nicely. And, uh, and I guess this can be coupled with other tools like that rank or similar. OK, so basically it's about knowing the, the structure of the network. But uh, at some point, I mean, in your slides, I saw application in the Italian network and the Austrian network. Can you say something about the applications if you did anything along these lines? Yes, uh, maybe I can use one of the slides I did not have time to show this one. The idea. one <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is now the Dutch interbank network. So it, it's a network for which, in collaboration with the central bank uh, in the Netherlands, we uh, could observe only the structure of the network, no, no link weights here, but the, but the true links in the network, yes. Um, over a period of 11 years, starting from uh, 1998, first quarter, to 2008, last quarter. So we started the analysis for a completely different reason, but eventually we noticed something interesting uh, because, I mean, I guess your question was going in the direction what to do with these models in reality. And now I would add, uh, imagine, imagine now something serious happens in the system, like a financial crisis. Uh, are these methods still of value or are they able to predict anything about the approaching crisis or something like that? So. Uh, here you see on, on the left column, so let's show this only, uh, the left column, uh, these are abundances of these three different motifs, so the number of uh, reciprocated pairs of nodes, uh, the number of singly connected pairs of nodes, and the number of nodes that are not connected. These are abundances, actually these are the z-scores of the abundances, so this is how many standard deviations away from the expected value in the model each of these abundances happens to be in the real network. So very 15 here on the top of the plot as a z-score means that the abundance of that dyad that is fully reciprocated is 15 standard deviations higher than you would expect on a network model. Now, what network model here? So here is a network constructed only knowing the total number of links. So it's basically an Erdos-Schrenny graph, but mm -hmm. directly. So you see that these abundances are all very different from, the z-scores are all very different from zero. So the network is very different from the Erdos-Schrenny random graph, clearly. Uh, and at the year of the crisis, there is this sudden uh, switch to different values. So there is a change in structure, in a sense, in the network. And when we found this, we said, OK, it makes sense. There has been a huge crisis in the interbank sector. We see the effect on the crisis on the network itself, but there is no early warning indicator whatsoever. Then we did the same analysis, but now using as a null model, a null model of the type that, we, that I just discussed before. So one of these reconstruction models, <coughs> basically by assuming in this case that we directly knew the in and the out uh, degree of every node. So you see that there is now a kind of window opening uh, three years before the crisis where there is a, a way more gradual transition between the initial, say, kind of stationary fluctuations of the z-scores to the values at the crisis. So we interpreted all this in the following sense, well, we have seen that these reconstruction methods work quite well, but all the tests that were made were on periods away from crisis. So it makes sense that also in this network here, up to 2004, so in the white region, the z-scores are quite small, so the reconstructed ensemble uh, is a fair representative uh, of the original network. Now, this, for statistical physicists, this really looks like this network seems to be at some equilibrium, right? 
because if your empirical network is kind of consistent with a reconstructed ensemble, which is a maximum entropy ensemble in the end, it means that there is some uh, notion of equilibrium of, of the empirical network. So what we see starting in the blue phase is now a deviation from the reconstructed ensemble that grows bigger and bigger. So this is a kind of the real network going out of equilibrium in a sense. And eventually there is this final configuration which, which is very different from the beginning one. Now this doesn't mean that we would have been in the position of predicting the, the crisis and its effects. But clearly this is showing up real time that there is now a sudden change in the network and there is now an, an increasing deviation from a reference model. So I think at the moment we, we have this interpretation, I mean, that the, the, the reconstruction methods work well when they are applied to a network at some kind of equilibrium. But they may fail when there are approaching crises. And it's precisely combining the real, the knowledge of the real network with the reconstructed ensemble that you can spot these deviations. So for central banks that do know their own domestic network, this could be very interesting as a kind of monitoring tool to see whether something is suddenly changing in, the, in their network. Is there any central bank already adopting these kind of tools? Well, the, the Dutch central bank has been involved in uh, many tests now. So mm -hmm. I've learned that it's not so easy also for researchers in a central bank to convince the, the supervisors themselves at the same central bank. So there is a very hard communication in between the departments. So we learned that the, the research department was separate from the data department and from the supervision department. So the, these things seem to communicate very slowly. So at the moment there is no, uh, I mean, um, uh, dashboard that has been really uh, created using these methods, but at least the research part in the bank uh, is quite uh, uh, interested in continuing researching in this direction. Okay, thanks a lot, Diego. Very, very interesting. I guess, I mean, if no further questions are coming from the audience, we thank you again. I mean, perhaps we can switch on the mics and give a big applause to Diego. you in Paris in our lab. So we, we finished this session and uh, next set in cell seminar will be next week in week time. So next Wednesday, December 9th, always at 5 p.m. In this case, the speaker will be Emmanuel Derudy, the, the, the head of the music team at CSR Paris. And so the topic will be music and AI application for music. Thanks a lot again for listening to Diego and see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you again for inviting me. Thanks, Vittorio and all the team.